This presentation is on the photographs of the Japanese-American relocation during World War II that were taken by Dorothea Lang and Ansel Adams. Dorothea Lang joined the War Relocation Authority staff in 1942. She was hired to document all phases of the internment process, from the assembly centers to the camp itself. You've seen this Lang photograph in your textbook, and Allender talks about the message conveyed by the signs, juxtaposed with the American flag in the background. Uh, what you're seeing here is not the same version of the image that's printed on page 32 of Moving Images, by the way, as this version doesn't show the flag. It must have been taken at the same time, though, based on the car that's parked in front of the building. Several of Lang's pre-evacuation photographs show children pledging allegiance to the flag and visually demonstrating that they're loyal U.S. citizens. This is probably the most famous of Dorothea Lang's images uh, that's sort of on this theme. Lang started to photograph the moment the roundups began on March 22nd, and she was officially on the WRA payroll as of April 2nd. During April and May, she photographed nonstop and continued into June and early July. Here's a shot of the notice that all Japanese Americans are to register to start the evacuation process. This photograph, in case you can't read the uh, caption below, uh, reads, Residents of Japanese ancestry appearing at the civil control station for registration in response to the Army's exclusion order number 20. The evacuees will be housed in war relocation authority centers for the duration. Uh, and they look like uh, any uh, people, maybe standing in line to buy a ticket, uh, standing in line for a whole series of different reasons, uh, but in this case, of course, they're standing in line to essentially go off to prison. This caption reads, A soldier and his mother in a strawberry field, Florin, uh, California, May 1942. This photograph was taken as the Japanese-American residents hurried to, to harvest their crops and settle their affairs prior to evacuation. Most were forced to sell their homes, their businesses, and their property at a huge loss. Buyers knew they were desperate to sell since they had so little time to do so, and forced them to take very low prices. The caption here reads, Tenant farmer of Japanese ancestry who has just completed settlement of their affairs and everything is packed ready for evacuation on the following morning to an assembly center. May 1942. And I think if you look at this picture, the man's body language really says it all. This photograph really makes the point that people's identity had been reduced to a number written on the tag that was affixed to their clothing. While Japanese American men were taught not to show emotion, one can't help but feeling that this man is repressing a deep sense of guilt, which was felt by many Japanese Americans, who vaguely thought they must have done something wrong if they were being rounded up by the military and sent to concentration camps. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the caption here is, A crowd of onlookers on the first day of evacuation from the Japanese quarter in in San Francisco, who themselves will be evacuated within three days. And if you look at this photograph, I think you notice, uh, in particular, the Anglo-American military officer who's been detailed to control the crowd. Uh, and the crowd 
Uh, seems hardly to need controlling. Here's a photograph also taken in San Francisco of what were officially called residents of Japanese ancestry. Uh, and they're standing in line awaiting a bus that will take them uh, to one of the assembly centers. Here's a child who's wearing his Boy Scout uniform with an identity tag pinned to his jacket, which seems like kind of an ironic juxtaposition. Here, people are getting onto the train that will take them to one of the temporary assembly centers where they would stay until the government had built more permanent camps for them elsewhere. Most of Lang's shots show people who are smiling from the train windows as though they're about to undertake a pleasure trip. Occasionally, Lang was able to capture a more pensive expression. In one case, she actually photographed a woman who was crying and wiping her eyes. Here's another shot of the same woman. Here are families who arrive who are arriving at one of the assembly centers, looking apprehensive. And here are people actually entering one of the assembly centers. These are the kind of images that Allender notes were impounded during the war, presenting the internees more or less as prisoners entering a prison. The barracks at this particular assembly camp were former horse stalls at what had been a racetrack. The living conditions were very primitive and people complained that the, uh, the barracks smelled of horse manure. Here's an interior. There was little privacy and the conditions were spartan. I'm reading from the caption for this photograph here. Many evacuees suffer from a lack of their accustomed activity. The attitude of the man shown in this photograph is typical of the residents and assembly centers, and because there is not much to do and not enough work available, they mill around, they visit, they stroll, and they linger to while away the hours. Once the permanent camps, such as the one here at Manzanar, were ready for occupancy, the internees were moved there. You can see the barracks in the background and even further back the mountains. The location was remote, but Ansel Adams was impressed by the beauty of the landscape, uh, as is discussed in your textbook and you'll see in some of the upcoming images by Adams. Internees found the camps to be cold in winter, hot in the summer, and windy year-round. It was a far cry from the lush, green, mild coastal California areas that they came from and were used to. Lang undoubtedly saw the camp at its worst, as evacuees were still being brought in. People were traumatized, confused, restless, 
family discipline was beginning to break down, and there was little agreement among the internee community as to how to respond to the outrage of re relocation. This photograph shows a row of barracks in the background, with the center row of square buildings housing the laundry and sanitary units. The building on the right is the mess hall. People all ate in the, in the mess hall, and that undermined family interaction, since families were not necessarily eating together in the mess halls. They used toilets uh, and took showers uh, in the sanitary units with minimal privacy which was abhorrent to Japanese Americans who had a strong sense of personal privacy. Many people developed constipation during the first year or so due to these conditions. Also, you should notice the barrenness of the immediate setting uh, here in the foreground. There's clearly no grass. There's not much of anything. The internees tried to maintain a semblance of normal life, cultivating their own gardens, for example, as you see here. Or landscaping their sections of the barracks. According to the caption, uh, this was a former professional landscape gardener for large estates in Southern California, demonstrating his skill and ingenuity in creating from materials close at hand a desert garden alongside his home in the barracks at this War Relocation Authority Center. Allender talks about the difficulties the schools had at first obtaining furniture and school supplies and even teachers. Uh, an elementary school, this is a caption, with voluntary attendance has been established with volunteer evacuee teachers many of whom are, co are college graduates. No school equipment is at yet obtainable, and available de desks, I'm sorry, tables and benches are used. However, classes are often held in the shade of the barrack building at this war relocation authority, which indicates it's probably way too hot inside the building uh, for people to be able to stay in there. Lang makes it a point to show internees doing all American kinds of things. These are not foreigners, the images imply. Or here in this photograph. By the way, restrictions surrounded Lang as she worked. She could take no pictures of the barbed wire, or the watchtowers, or the armed soldiers and she could take pictures of nothing that hinted of resistance within the camps. She was constantly followed. She was discouraged even from speaking with internees. MPs repeatedly stopped her and demanded her credentials. She was required to turn over all negatives, prints, and undeveloped film from her work, and then her photographs were impounded for the duration of the war. Photographs taken by both Lang and Adams, people look directly into the camera, demonstrating they have nothing to hide. This photograph actually is rather similar to the one that Ansel Adams placed at the end of his book, Born Free and Equal, reprinted on page 71 of your text, and more typical of Lang's photographs from Manzanar than Adams's. Here, Lang aims her camera at a grandfather and his grandson. Notice the way she frames him by the barracks and the mountains. In her photographs, the mountains seem more like a wall, pinning in the internees rather than an element of the landscape that serves to uplift the spirits of those incarcerated, incarcerated in the camp, which I think is more uh, Adams's way of dealing with it. In her photographs, Lang focuses upon those most vulnerable to the intrusive gaze of the documentary photographer, women with babies, small children, and the elderly, as you see here.
This is a particularly sad image, I think. Lang points her camera up at the grandfather, who looks sad. Again, we see the, the barracks and the mountains surrounding the figures, even though they're more blurred in this version of the picture. Lang's photographs are powered by her sense of outrage over the callousness exhibited by the military and the trampling of Americans' rights by their own government. She photographed people not as heroic figures, but as semi-tragic ones. Lang's pictures were suppressed for the duration of World War II, and they were never actively distributed. After the war, the Army quietly placed them in the National Archives. Only once were, were any number, any significant number of them published in Executive Order 9066, a report by one of Lang's assistants and his wife for the UCLA Asian American Center in 1972. In 2006, Linda Gordon and Gary uh, Okihiro published Impounded, Dorothea Lang and the Censored Images of, Dorothy, of, I'm sorry, of Japanese American Internment, which was a book about and of Lang's photographs from this period. It's quite an interesting book, and I suggest if you get it any extra time, you might want to look around for it. As you know from reading moving images, Ansel Adams came to Manzanar at the request of his friend, Ralph Merritt, the director. Adams made several trips to Manzanar in the fall and winter of 1943 and the spring of 1944. He used his own film and supplies and was not on the government payroll. And he had only three restrictions, fewer than Lang. No barbed wire, no armed guards, and no guard towers in his photographs. Although Manzanar still looks rather barren in this photograph, the camp was much less permitting than it had been in the early days when Lang worked there. By this time, the inhabitants had established farming, industries, shops, limited self-government, schools, and a newspaper. And also, the camp was less crowded. It started with over 11,000 evacuees, but the population had dwindled by half when Adams first arrived. Uh, many of them were eventually uh, permitted to, um, to get jobs in other parts of the country, as long as they stayed away from the, the West Coast, which was considered more of the war zone. In pictures taken at long range, such as this one and the previous one, the Sierras hover over the camp and suggest its isolation. Nevertheless, in Adams's view, the setting was bene beneficial for those living at Manzanar. And I'll quote from his book, The acrid splendor of the desert, surrounded with towering mountains, has strengthened the spirit of the people of Manzanar. Unquote. Adams aimed to depict the efforts of the Japanese Americans to build a livable community. Doing so would accelerate their passage into full American citizenship by showing they were worthy of being U.S. citizens. His goal was to present the residents as unthreatening, Americanized, open. His use of extreme close-ups and strong outdoor lighting produced a visual rhetoric of people with nothing to hide. Here he shows uh, a man who's doing productive, useful work, unloading a, a produce truck. Here, the woman and her children pose in front of their barracks, wearing typically American clothing and having typically American hairstyles. We see that they have made some efforts to make their dwelling more attractive, with curtains on the windows. It's hard, though, to ignore the tar paper walls and the scrubby terrain beyond their so-called home. Note again, Adams' efforts to show the residents as 100% American. 
the girl in the foreground as a page boy hairstyle worn by girls her age across the country at this time, and she wears a cardigan sweater, again, very typical clothing for a young American girl at this time. What could be more American than playing volleyball? And notice the camera angle here and its impact on the way we read this photograph. Nearly one quarter of Adams's portraits depicted young Japanese-American girls, American subjects who offer the possibility of later producing tractable, cooperative, and loyal citizens of a post-war nation. Depictions of school boys would suggest adult male militarization and this is presumably why Adams takes so few pictures of young males. Again, an effective uh, and affecting image of a young girl uh, who faces uh, into the direct sun, smiles winningly at us, uh, and by hairstyle and also by clothing, presents herself as 100% American. Here's another Adams portrait. Uh, again, the subject looks the viewer straight in the, the eye. Even though she's in the shadow this time, this is offset by the fact that she's wearing her nurse's uniform, which suggests to us that she's a productive member of her society. As we see in this next photograph, showing her displaying a new baby to its mother. Like the photographs of the younger girls playing volleyball and doing calisthenics, this nurse and her friends are engaging in typically American pastimes here playing bridge, a favorite activity of women throughout the 1940s and 50s. Their hairstyle and clothing is, again, typically American. We almost don't notice the shabby surroundings of the barracks in which they sit. When Adams takes photographs of adult males, uh, these are, present uh, almost archetypes of uh, blue and white collar wartime workers, showing them to be productive citizens posing no threat to the nation. This person is identified as an electrician, and we see a thicket of electrical wires behind him. Even more productive, presumably, is this soldier, again shot in full sunlight, showing he has nothing to hide. Adam's portrait of Corporal uh, Jimmy Sohara on the left is quite different from Langs's portrait on the right of a young Japanese-American man whose Caucasian wife is living with him in the camp, together with their small child. Lang depicts a man whose features are darker, who is not as well-groomed as the soldiers are, whose furrowed brow indicates worry. Instead of a portrait of a patriotic American serving his co country that Adams has given us, uh, Lang uh, portrays an American fully assimilated into mainstream uh, society through his marriage to a Caucasian woman, who has nevertheless been sent to a concentration camp. On the other hand, Adams's photographs and text don't always focus on the, pros the positive, as his final image from Born Free and Equal makes clear, the one on the left. Uh, this is fo his photograph of Yuchi Harata, uh, and I think uh, it, in juxtaposition with the Lang photograph over on the right, uh, suggests that at least in some cases, both of these photographers were critical of the internment process. Here's one of a relatively few uh, picture that, at, that Adams took of the interior of a barracks dwelling. The family seems to have furnished their unit much as any American family would have done, 
the angle from which uh, Adams has taken this picture doesn't tell us how cramped these units actually were. Here's one of the photographs that Allender discusses at some length in Moving Images. The juxtaposition of the objects on this tabletop tell a very specific story about this family and their values, which I won't go into since Allender does a good job of analyzing it herself.